dharma at the center of the Hindu civilization. Um, do you agree with Sachin when he says um, sex work being accepted as a profession but not glorified? Yes, I do, absolutely. I'm not here to glorify the sex industry, not at all. I've been in some very, very dark places. But I do think the view that the sex industry, first of all, is never going to go away, mm. and as such needs to be recognized, and that the people within the industry need to be protected to the best of our ability as a society, is a long distance away from glorifying it. Okay. Um, what about um, society um, at this stage? Um, is it at the stage of decadence, or uh, are we more liberal at the moment? Where should sex work be heading? I think we should be heading towards a more liberal view. That's certainly the view taken by international health agencies. It's, it's not even a liberal view, it's more a recognition of this is what needs to happen in order to protect our health and our welfare and our human rights. Okay. Sachin, what, what do you think about that? Where is society right now? Um, I, I, I don't know is the short answer. But, but, but just something really that sort of, from a civilizational perspective, so I don't particularly mean here and now, but your thoughts on something. Isn't there an argument to be had that, you know, <clears throat> um, by pushing the boundaries of, of liberty further and further out, uh, effectively we are, um, through the back door I suppose, encouraging young people uh, an option to kind of commoditize themselves as a way of getting through, whether it be college, university, mm. uh, some hard times, whatever that they may be. Uh, is there not an argument there to be had that, well, by, by liberalizing any more, you're kind of just almost encouraging that flow? Uh, well, we know because the evidence from New Zealand shows us that when they decriminalized there, there was no change actually in the number of sex workers. So it's not as if there was a massive surge forward for everybody to work in the industry. The decision to enter the sex industry is a very personal one. It's driven by many factors, um, sometimes by choice, sometimes by um, some small element of coercion, but almost always by poverty. And if we want to reduce the number of sex workers, then we need to tackle the driving forces behind uh, the entrance. So that's drug addiction, it's poverty, it's austerity, it's benefit cuts. It's not to make it illegal to pay, that doesn't work. I'm sorry, I've gone completely off topic. But no, to answer your original question, when we decriminalize and we recognize sex work as a, formal, a form of labor, it does not necessarily encourage people to join, no. So, so if it's about poverty, just to sort of push that a little bit further, is it right to think that the more affluent the society becomes, um, no, let me put it the way, the, 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 the more affluent the individuals within that society become, we should see fewer and fewer sex workers. Very difficult for me to say how that would work on a socio-economic basis. I, I'm just thinking because you said vast majority enter this profession out of poverty. Well, it depends on what, on what level you're looking at, at the industry. So, for example, a lot of people would think of sex work in terms of a woman standing on a street, okay? Well, we know because statistics show us that that actually forms about 12% of the industry. Very much so when you're looking at the street trade, you would be looking more towards people that are suffering from um, addictions and people that are laboring under poverty as well. The kind of, in, if you go further up into flats and brothels and independence, then it tends to be more of a, in some respects, a, a choice. So there is a socioeconomic element to it there as well. Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, being coerced into prostitution. I mean, how, how does the current law protect women who are coerced into pr prostitution? Well, it's... it's how, 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 where, where is the difference between coercion mm -hmm. and entering out of choice? Because of poverty or uh, any other circumstances? Well, I think where the law, and probably Mr. Bannister would be best to answer this than I would, I think where the law draws the line is where there's a third party intervening. So if there's a third party, a man, a, a pimp or whatever, a trap that intervenes and kind of coerces that woman into the sex trade for his or her own gain, that that's where, um, and when, that's where the, the differentiation is, I suppose. Okay, so who would report coercion? Well, um, it's usually by sex workers themselves. Okay. Um, and sometimes by clients. So does the current law um, 
allow sex worker to report coercion? Yes, yeah, right. the current law does. Right, okay. Um, Sachin, you mentioned um, legalizing um, in, in the Hindu civilization, it was more regulated, yeah? Won't regulating the um, sex industry just expand it even further? The, 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 there's certainly an argument to be had there that, that um, um, not all that was old is gold. Um, that's the first thing you kind of come to appreciate when you study history. Um, not all old is gold. So certainly um, there were elements, like I say, societies ebb and flow. There have been times where um, uh, certainly when society, uh, the values of that society had become um, hedonistic, uh, decadent, uh, societies usually suffer and flourish. They lose their ca capacity to grow, develop, compete, etc., uh, etc. Et um, but um, I think the whole point about whether it be the Greeks or specifically within v v Vijayanagar, the, the largest Hindu empire between the 12th century to about the 16th century, uh, Vijayanagar, uh, which is you know, often seen as the epitome of uh, Hindu civilization in the medieval ages, um, wonderful works of science, technology, mathematics, medicine, all came out of Vijayanagar. But Vijayanagar uh, had legalized brothels. They were collecting tax revenue uh, across their empire through, uh, th th through brothels. And, and the state was uh, highly regimental on not only who worked there, but they were given training courses. They were also uh, given a pension when they retired. Mm. And really interestingly enough, um, they were also monitored who went to visit these brothels. And there was also a tally of that. Now, I'll give you an example. So there's a wonderful book here. The, the position of women in Hindu civilization, but seriously suggest anybody interested in just the condition of women within Hindu civilization across the last 3,000 years, three millennia, uh, you want to study this. So then really interesting things happen. So for example, in Vijayanagar, the, we think roughly um, that um, uh, the, the literacy rates between men and women was quite equal, um, quite similar. But nearly every single dancing girl, courtesan, sex worker in, a, uh, in brothels were state educated. They could all read and write. They could all, um, um, they were all proficient in literature, etc. Many of them then became dramatists and playwrights. So my only point is that I think the society had a very different view and a very different approach. But society, Hindu society specifically, has always seen sex work as something that is very base. It is something that, you, you know, it's really sort of, I suppose, and I don't want to caricature it, but it's bad karma if you end up in that profession. It's unfortunate. But the trick is, is how do we get you out of that position? How do we get you so that you never have to do that again? Um, and there was a massive emphasis on the people who used um, the sex workers, that there was always this societal shame, which is why the state in Vijayanagar used to log who visited the brothels, because it was a mark of shame that you're having to do this. Um, so it was kind of a strange system. So, so Hindu society has always sort of, you know, Hindu society has managed a way of essentially putting this entire issue into a quiet corner and regulating and managing it. What do you Rather, think about that? Yes, I think. What do you think about the karma part of it? The karma part. Um, uh, what I mean by was, was that it? It, 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 it was always seen as unfortunate. It's an unfortunate state of affairs when a woman has to sell or a man has to sell uh, 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 sexual uh, favors for for remuneration. It's always seen as a something that is unfortunate that that has to occur. Are you in an unfortunate position right now? No, I don't believe so. I don't think. I don't think I'm unfortunate at all. Um, I guess I have been in the past, but I, certainly not now. I'm very much in control of my destiny and quite happy with the direction my life is taking. And in fact, sex work is opening doors for me and that it's financing my studies. Um, and so I'm quite happy. But I think what you've touched on there is um, the element of shame. That's important. Shame on both the seller and the buyer. And, and really, that's what we need to kind of strip back a little bit. Because let's remember, these are consenting adults behind closed doors, 
you know, so that's, that's where I come from it. And I think you touched on something else during your talk, which I found very interesting as well, which is that if you find the exchange of money for sex, you know, not really, it doesn't sit quite well with your morality, that's okay, I perfectly understand that. I'm not asking you to accept that what I do is, sits with your particular morals, but what I am asking to do when I ask for decriminalization is I'm asking for the right to work in safety. I don't talk about empowerment, I don't talk about shame or any of those things, I talk about autonomy, I talk about agency and I talk about safety and those are the key messages to take away, I think. Can I, can I ask a probing question, if you don't sure. mind? So, let's suppose the state, for, 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 for argument's sake, uh, that the state was to fund all of your education and et cetera, et cetera. Would you then still choose sex work as a way of getting through life? If, if the state, let's suppose, for argument's sake, the state was to fund everything you needed, absolutely everything. I would probably scale back my activities by a lot, but I've been doing what I do for quite a long time now. And so I've built up a, a relationship with some of my guys which goes way beyond client provider. Um, some of them are, I work with a lot of disabled guys and terminally ill guys as well, and we've become friends, I think, more than anything else. But would I proactively go out and seek new clients? Probably not, no. Right. So, 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 right, so that, that, that helps to understand that, that idea better. Yes. We'll come to your questions in just one minute. So, um, this is a question to both of you. What advice would you give to anyone considering work in this industry? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I, I spend, we back to the question of glorification, I spend a lot of time, believe it or not, talking women out of entering the industry. Okay. I ask them to consider the stigma, the secrecy, the lies, what would happen if it came out in the press, what would happen if their employers found out, if their family found out. So yes, it can be very rewarding financially and also sometimes emotionally, but there's a big price to be paid. And I ask them to consider all of those things before they enter the profession. Sachin, would you like to say anything before I open the floor to questions? Um, I, I, I think the only thing I, I would emphasize is this um, idea of dharma a little bit, if I can. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So, so um, Hindu society, I mean, all of us will be quite familiar with it, but I, I, I suppose uh, for, for, for Laura's sake as well, is that we've always had these, um, uh, the, the idea of rishis and sadhus, people who, uh, what I would now class in 21st century lexicon as devoted actors, the people who psychologically become one with their idea, the people who embody the idea that they, and they literally become, there's no division between what they think and what they do. And rishis and sadhus have always in Hindu society uh, guided civilization. And people throughout the millennia, the one consistent thing that you find within Hindu society is that we have always um, taken guidance uh, from these devoted actors. And these devoted actors have always been in a state of tension between how society ebbs and flows. If society goes in one direction, you will always see that class of men and women propagate something else to bring balance back in order. And when society becomes too regressive, suppressive, uh, orthodox, it becomes more liberal. It's just interesting for us to consider what is our sadhu saying now? What are, what are our uh, teachers and our people we look up to for spiritual and philosophical guidance? What are they currently saying? It's quite interesting because they often feel, they are often on top of the pulse of society, which way society is generally flowing. And I just find that quite, quite a fascinating thing for, for us to consider. Um, so, so, you know, to this day, uh, these things are happening uh, in our society. Uh, these, these devoted actors are present. And, and the one consistent stream is this notion of dharma. Ultimately, what will help the society flourish? Ultimately, what will help the individual flourish? Uh, and in that flourishing, a big element of that is, of course, safety and all the rest of it, economic well-being, education. Um, but there's something also about aspirations. So in Hindu society, sex work was never aspirational. Um, but yet it was accepted and it was something, hence I always say it was accepted but not glorified. Uh, and I think that balance is the key thing that I, I, I think Hindu society or, or Hindu values can help us understanding our current debate. That's all I'd like to 
Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. Um, questions? Thank you. A gentleman over there, please. Thank you. Would stop. Would stop coming to you so you can get another, get another job. No, not at all. That's like asking a restaurateur if they wish their customers to stop buying their food. No, I don't. I don't. I, a lot of my guys, as I said, have been with me for years, and we've built up a great relationship. So, no, I don't wish that they would. Uh, I don't see that that would change the way I would feel about my job. I think I would just change the way I worked. Should I start again, or you could hear me? You could hear me, yeah? yeah? So, so um, uh, my, my, my point there was going that the, uh, sexual gratification, sexual intercourse, hits the deeper psyche of, of, of what it means to be a human being. And whether it's innate or it's a social construct, regardless, the fact is that sex and, and sexual gratification is, is, is something which can shake us at our core. It can quite literally build you as a, as a flourishing individual, and it can destroy you um, as well as a human being. And the really interesting thing about um, uh, uh, selling your body for sex is that effectively what you're saying is you're not just selling your body, you're actually selling your psyche to some degree too. You are effectively allowing the other, in some respects, to potentially damage you in the most deeper sense possible. Now, that could be a social construct or it could be something innate. Regardless, that does seem to happen. The other thing is, is that it's not the necessarily the sex in itself that could be the problem. It's all the things that surround this, this business of sex, which is the, uh, the, the coercion, the drugs, the poverty, the, 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 the social breakdowns often, the loneliness, etc., etc. So I think from a, uh, the idea of morality, sexual morality, I think... There is certainly a psychological difference between a bricklayer and a sex worker. I think there's definitely a psychological difference between um, you know, a footballer who, who uses his body to make a living and uh, a, a sex worker. I, I think there's something which hits at the core of what it means to be human. And therefore, the way, and, and of course the other thing is this of course, sex is a very powerful force in human society. Sex is something that Freud said in the most modern language, right the way down to our sadhus and rishis that have said it. Sex is a very, very powerful force. It needs to be treated with care and handled with respect. It, it, it's something which um, uh, needs to be, I suppose, uh, managed and, and, and given a direction to, a flow to. It's not to be suppressed. But certainly there is a difference because sex is a powerful force and the psyche itself is touched when you, when, when you sort of uh, uh, engage in sex. So there's my reasons. Uh, uh, Laura will just answer that question for the gentleman. Just finish off. Yes, sure, absolutely. Um, to, to answer your question, it's on. To answer your question, um, is there a difference between a bricklayer and a sex worker? Well, yes, there probably is, but I, I wouldn't view it as 
to perhaps the depth that Satchin would, and that's with the greatest of respect. Um, in fact, I'm waiting for somebody to make me a flourishing individual. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we do. We, we do use our bodies in the same in the same regard. For me, I suppose. Well, the first thing to say is that sex is actually about five percent of what I do. So a lot of my time with my clients is spent by being by listening, by being um, by being some, a form of counsellor, by chatting away to them, by you know, um, just being being there, being in that moment with them. So it's not as if I I count it as like a gross invasion of self, if you see what I mean. Also, I can, I can make a distinction between sex for commercial purposes and sex with a partner that I'm deeply in love with. And there's a huge difference. Because as Sachin said, um, and he's quite right, in that you give so much of yourself into it, that, that, that action. Well, I certainly do with a partner. Um, and I suppose I do with clients as well, but it's entirely different. It's very, very hard to describe. There's a, there's a part of me that I keep back, my most inner sanctum I keep back for my personal lover, and that's, that's important. Thank you, Laura. She's coming. Okay, uh, Sachin, I, 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 you know, you've been hitting on the Dharma quite a lot. Uh, apparently, there, it is mentioned in the Kama Sutra. Uh, the Kama Sutra really says on sex, it's more than a manual, in fact, it's only 20%. The sex manual is only about 20% of it. There's a lot of text on it about love, marriage, and everything else. Uh, it does say, right, that um, you, know, you, should not, you should be virtuous uh, rather than, uh, than s seeking for money. So I think uh, there is a, a moral statement on that. But in reality, as you, you, you state your state policy, uh, that's mentioned in the, uh, Rama, uh, the Ramayana. Apparently, Rama Your is supposed to have uh, descended, uh, has been, uh, was produced as a, as a product of a sexual act, allegedly a sexual act, in which the king paid some Brahmins for the procreation of Rama and his brothers. So uh, it, it goes to the root of Hindu, the Hindu religion. Uh, but we don't know if that's an a, 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 a attack which was brought in, because there's been a lot of contentions in Hinduism. You know, the Buddhist versions and the Hindu versions. What's your question? Is there well, my question is basically that uh, Hinduism recognizes uh, these things, right? But it also recognizes that there's virtue in not having paid sex. Uh, for so, dangers so, that it represents. Yeah, so if, if I tackle that, I mean, that's really well put, actually. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Anybody who's in any depth, and, and I don't mean watching the uh, something... Chopra Mahabharat, by the way. That doesn't count as deeply studying Mahabharat. But anybody who's actually studied the Mahabharat will discover very quickly that so many characters, so many characters, male and female, engaged in all sorts of sexual moral acts. Some were sexually immoral, some were sexually moral. Um, and they had lots of different repercussions. So Hindu society is very accepting of the fact that Sex is this force that flows through human nature and it needs to be managed and people need to be taught and I suppose uh, nurtured uh, in order to uh, utilize it to flourish. Now the Kama Sutra is effectively a work, a sutra on pleasure. Uh, but it, it talks about, and I'm, not, I'm no scholar on the Kama Sutra by any means, but from my understanding of it and through some of the things that I've studied, um, it's effectively a way of human flourishing uh, but channeling pleasure in the right way. So it does talk about marriage, it does talk about consensual, it does talk about uh, sex within marriage. Uh, you know, it, it has a wide plethora of ideas within it. Um, and, 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 as, and as far as the idea of, you're absolutely right, that, that this idea of dharma, dharma does predicate, uh, over and over again it seems to go towards this way, that um, it is not preferable to pay for sex or to sell sex because uh, for the very reason that um, you can flourish beyond it. No matter how pleasurable it might be, as some of us may take it for granted, but, but you know, for, for, for the record, I suppose, pleasure is one element of human nature. Our roles as human beings to become a complete, fully uh, developed human being is to go beyond the, the, the desire and the... And, and, and the um, uh, the, the chase of pleasure uh, and, and to, to almost surpass that as a human being. So certainly there is some um, 
view on that, I suppose. Thank you. Okay. So as Neela mentioned when she, when she opened this, uh, it's a, this is a complex topic. And then as Sachin, as you mentioned in your speech that Hindu society ebbs and flows through time. Say if prostitution was decriminalized and the Hindu society became more liberal, liberal we've recently going away from well, forced, forced marriages and having the women beyond a housewife and like, more accepting of they are, have they have, they have a place they can work themselves, they can earn themselves within the Hindu society. What are the chances are if, we, if the Hindu society became more liberal towards this, we would regress back to this oppression or suppression of women in terms of at home and in their work? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Fascinating question, in fact. Um, you know, the way I would look at it, it's something really interesting. So, um, may I just read something to you? You might find it fascinating, okay? So, I'd come prepared because I knew I was going to get some googlies thrown at me. But I wanted to, I wanted just to um, show you this. So, there's a traditional thinking, right? We are the products of the last 200 years, okay? And, and when you study Hindu history, the last 200 years have been our lowest point. They've been our most lowest point. And we are the products of that 200 years low point. When you look at the high points of Hindu civilization, it is fascinating to read. So this is pre-Vedic time. So this is, sorry, this is Vedic time. So we're talking about 800 BC to about first, second century CE, okay? These are, these are, this is over this period. And there's a wonderful bit here, which I wanted to talk to you. And you mentioned marriage and the housewife and how women are, are, are going beyond the world. So this is about women, okay? Um, Ordinary families, uh, sorry, so, uh, so cultured and rich families were naturally few in society. They had sufficient resources to enable them to employ special teachers, and then they named these special teachers. Um, and ordinary families were educating girls from the age of 10 and 11, and they could receive education. Um, right the way up until the second century CE, Hindu girls were equally educated towards the boys. And this notion of we prefer a boy, Hindu society has ebbed and flowed. Yes, there have been periods where, humans, where, where Hindu society had become such that, oh, we would love a boy. And there are ceremonies and rituals and shlokas around that. But there are equally periods in Hindu history where families prayed for a scholarly daughter. So, so uh, the idea of um, the Hindu housewife or the Hindu girl being married young or whatever, these are the product of the last 200 years where Hindu society regressed and has, I, I believe it was almost imploded on itself due to all sorts of circumstances. But as Hindu society rises and rediscovers its sense of self, um, I think it's flowing in a slightly different direction now and women are becoming more and more educated, more empowered. They are certainly becoming um, not only leaders of the house, but they are also obviously contributing in art, literature, history, academia, uh, medicine, etc. So, so maybe some sort of uh, natural balance is coming. And I, I would say we're still 200, 300 years away from a true flourishing. I think the Renaissance in Hindu culture is still just at the edges, um, actually. But so, I mean, it's an interesting point, but, but, but I think uh, your question about, you know, if we decriminalize it, will we regress? Actually, I think if you look at the civilizational perspective, we've been so uh, subjugated over the last few centuries that Hindu society will only now expand itself, expand its influence, expand its horizons, rethink, uh, sorry, uh, rethink the application of its core values of dharma and etc. I am from New Zealand where prostitution is decriminalized and I think what it enables and my personal experience has been it enables safety and security of people who are in the industry. What it also does, and we've been talking a lot about Padma and one which sustains, one which protects everything and sustains even the most vulnerable parts of our society. What decriminalization has done, particularly for me, is that you come across people in your circle who are openly able to talk about that they're engaged in this industry. They're in a service industry that no one wants to talk about and address on a, 
um, in a good Christian family or in a good Hindu family, you don't want to talk about it. But what it also has enabled is that you know that your friends in the situation, they're talking about it. And as a true Hindu, you want to help them. And you know that you're helping them to go to get better education because you're influencing, you're a positive influence on them wanting to be educated, wanting to get a better job, get out of it. But because they're only openly talking about it, is that you're able to do it. And while you're helping someone and someone's coming out of it, you, you're going to bed every night knowing that your friend's safe. They're not in a dark alley somewhere and next morning you'll wake up to a really bad news in the newspaper. So for, for me, um, that's just something I wanted to add to this whole dharma discussion um, of decriminalization. Thank you. Gentlemen over there, please. Yeah, a question for Laura. Laura, first of all, welcome to Leicester. Leicester's got a history of the Irish community that settled back in the 1940s. And I don't know if you speak any Gaelic, yeah? But Makara and Chukyala. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I would just want to say, in terms of the Northern Ireland experience that you have, is the prostitution, is there any push and pull factors of the prostitution? Because if you look at the world, right, poverty plays a key role in why people end up in the prostitution sort of industry. Now, do you see any underlining causes that causes this poverty to get people to get into the situation that everybody finds themselves in that industry? What causes poverty? That's a very, very big question, isn't it? It's, um, some people would say it's the Tory party. Um, it's, 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 it's benefit cuts, it's, it's, um, it's bedroom tax, it's, it's, you know, it's just a, a change. The way the society has changed now, it's women that have had their husbands simply walk out and leave them with four or five children. It's lots of things cause poverty, deaths in the family. Um, it's impossible to say what causes it, but um, I do think that we, need, we do need to look at our, our social welfare system, absolutely, and provide better supports for people who may or may not make the decision to enter the industry for the wrong reasons. Um, does that answer your question? And also, in terms of the Northern, Northern Ireland thing, is the religion, uh, in terms of the Catholic religion and the Protestant religion, does that play a role um, in terms of policy? Does religion play a role? Uh, interestingly, and I think this will be something that Sachin will be interested in, is that Northern Ireland, as you probably know, is deeply divided between Irish Catholics and um, uh, more older Presbyterians who would consider themselves Christians. Um, and actually, for me, for me, as somebody who's learning Christianity and trying to live my life as a Christian now, I find them the most deeply unchristian people I've ever come across in my life, but that's another day's work. But what I have found, regardless of whether you're talking about Catholics or, or Protestants in Northern Ireland, is the more you repress the society and the more you tell them not to do something and that it's dirty and it's evil and it's, they shouldn't do that, etc., the more they'll do it. Because it's, it's, it's illicit, it's a thrill. Bear in mind that a lot of men in Northern Ireland, uh, even before the law was changed, actually believed that it was illegal to pay for sex anyway and still did it anyway before the law came in. So that it's had very, very little impact, and therefore it has failed in its objective of reducing demand. On your talk, and what you're talking, you talk about molarity of morals, and you use the word morals quite openly. The first question I want to ask you, and it's two or three together, is how do you define morals? Yes, that's the first one. Because you also mentioned back in the X years ago that prostitution was inverted commas, legalized, yes, where, you, where after the trade, the person will get so-called state pension. And if that sort of setup was done today, this is also that to you, Laura, Laura, would it be morally acceptable with what's going on? And because then again, when we started, we had um, the gentleman talking about all these laws. And if you break these laws, is that, you know, are you immoral? So what is morality as the first Morality, point. yeah. So morality, as I, as, I, as I explained, is that morality, by definition, is the underlying principles which allows a society or the individual to discriminate between good and bad behavior, right and wrong action. So it's the underlying principles that you have, whether it's conscious or unconscious. Uh, these are societal constructs um, um, that ebb and flow. So, so the application of dharma, for example, the, 
Dharma is the principle upon which we discriminate good and bad. But the application, excuse me, the application of Dharma has changed with time and it has always changed with time. And therefore, it's always in a state of flux. And so then the question becomes, well, who decides what is dharmic and what is not dharmic? And there, within Hindu society as a whole, remember, Hindu society is not a political movement. We don't have an ayatollah. We don't have a pope. There is no church, right? There is no Vatican. But Hindu society has, over thousands and thousands of years, I believe, uh, got a very, very sophisticated iterative system that scholars, sadhus, rishis, uh, you know, um, uh, the aristocracy, uh, kings, they all engage in dialogue, debate, discussion, and society swings. Uh, and society applies dharma in a very different way. The one thing that is key about dharma, though, is that it's, it's this notion of human flourishing at the societal level and the individual level. So, so for me, my interpretation, it's only my interpretation, is that anything which allows the individual to flourish beyond their current limitations, wherever that limitation might be, is a dharmic action, or is, is a dharmic act, is a dharmic mode. So if I can raise my level of consciousness from my, so for example, if I only think about myself and my own state of affairs, then my consciousness is at that level. However, the moment I begin to believe that I doesn't end here, but the I ends with my family, now my consciousness has risen. Then if my I grows beyond my family towards my community or towards my neighborhood, now my I has expanded even more. And the idea, uh, I believe, is that, you know, dharma is the process by which we begin to uh, expand our sense of ego, sense of I, towards the community, towards society. And therefore, um, how we apply dharma is, is a, always something that's in flux, always something that's changing. I think the other question was, was more for Laura. Would you be so kind as to repeat the, the question for me? If, if the setup that Sachi mentioned X years ago where the prostitution was basically legalized and then when the person can have state pension they're looked after by the state, if that sort of situation was today, mm -hmm. would that be more acceptable? Would it be more morally right to do what's going on? Would it be morally right? Well, it's, it's hard to know. Certainly, um, I can tell you now that I, I pay my taxes. I have, I have an accountant that prepares my reports every year and I pay my national insurance. And so a state pension awaits me, whether certain politicians like it or not. And I'll be, I'll be con I've been contributing to it for years. Um, would it be more preferable from a moral point? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I think it would give it more, more credibility and, and give, it the, um, uh, give it a sense of being valid labor, which is why we refer to it as sex work because it's a valid form of labor. But, um, and I think it would strip back the stigma. So that would certainly help towards our views on morality around it. But morality, I think, um, is such a subjective thing. Um, as Sachin just explained, it's about raising your eyes. So I'm not sure it would affect morality, but it can only be a good thing to, to look after those who are in the industry and to take care of them as they're leaving. Thank you. We're just going to take one last question, ladies and gentlemen. Just here, this young lady there. Thank you. Um, Hi. So I know you were talking quite a lot about the renaissance in Hindu thinking and also uh, you mentioned Hindu society as a whole, um, which I thought obviously was quite interesting because this debate is about prostitution being decriminalised in the UK. But how do you think, um, when you talk about the renaissance in Hindu thinking and we like apply the same issue in India, do, do you not think that there's um, a really big tension between the cultural Indian society and the Hindu society, so you know, women being ostracized and stigmatized, like Laura talks about a lot, um, which isn't necessarily to do with Hindu thinking, but it's all a bit convoluted. So, I mean, I guess my question is do you think that decriminalize, like, uh, decriminalization will contribute to uh, destigmatization, which would then create a renaissance in Hindu thinking, or do you think it happens the other way around? If that, sorry, if that. I'm not sure if I've understood your question, but uh, let's see if we can get there. So, so the, the, the core 
point, can you hear me? Yeah, the core point uh, that you seem to be making is the idea of renaissance. So let's just first understand something. Um, uh, India, uh, as it is currently, uh, <laughs> uh, the state um, by no means is a Hindu state, okay? Uh, by no means uh, does it even look to apply uh, the kind of mountains that I suppose older civilizations have had uh, when it comes to that subcontinent region. So I think India is, is, is quite an interesting state. But if you look at India now, India is certainly going through a massive form of liberalization. Huge. I mean, India was really fascinating. Sorry, can I read you some stats? So this is the number of women, number of women uh, to uh, boys, okay, who were um, uh, in education, okay, so for, for age distribution of 10,000 of each sex in India, okay, so um, under five boys in 1931 was 1,458, girls under five was 1,665, so there were always more girls than boys in India in 1931. Now look what happened. 1901, okay, so look at 1901, so we go back in time a little bit. There were 1,254 boys, and there were 1,339 girls. Go back to 1891, there was 1,409 boys, there was 1,527 girls. This myth that Hindu society has um, somehow persecuted um, uh, girls being born, all the, does happen, did happen, and it certainly uh, was uh, uh, a phenomenon in certain strata of society. But across the 300 million people that were there when, when these tables were done, certainly we now know, and it's becoming more and more clear in the academic circles, that there were powers that be during the colonial times that were being mischievous, who were, who were grossly uh, exaggerating certain um, uh, uh, conditions within certain strata of society. That's number one. Hindu society now is certainly liberating. Uh, women in India are getting married much later. They're educating a lot more. They are certainly um, contributing to the economy far more. Um, uh, India has, I think, one of the largest women's armed forces anywhere in the world. So certainly they are uh, taking on that. In fact, women has frontline, India has frontline soldiers that I think only now we're beginning to adopt, um, so, so on and so forth. So certainly I, I, I think um, uh, Hindu society has, if you look at it civilizationally, certainly has gone and has had some terrible practices within certain structures of its society. And it's gone from you know, being a very wealthy, affluent society in the 1500s, where it produced 22% of the world's GDP, down to 1% of the world's GDP by 1947. So Hindu society uh, has gone through a catastrophic demise in those years. Uh, and we are now just, I believe, at the cusp of that renaissance. Um, and that's why I keep saying renaissance, because if you look at that longer period of that ebb and flow, well, there's a trajectory that's happening. Thank you. Uh, we're going to end here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you have found this month and thought provoking enough to go out and explore the topic further. Um, Hindu civilization has approached these, issue, these issues in creative and innovative ways which have revel relevance even today. Um, there is no topic that the Hindu community cannot openly talk about. Vichar Manthan is here to give ideas a platform to be discussed and not to make political judgments. We have put up some material to read and watch on Facebook that may help you form your own judgments. Um, after listening to this talk, can I have a raise of hands about who would support decriminalization of sex work? Raise of hands. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Hope you all have a good evening and a very safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.